Polly, living online more positive or negative? I think, well, like most things, most aspects of it have some of each, right? So for me, one of the concerns is the whole, the whole filter bubble thing, the idea that with increased online life, we stop being exposed to ideas we disagree with because we follow the people on Twitter that we like, we get Facebook telling us what it thinks we want to hear mixed in with the ads that it thinks we want to see, and that it's increasingly possible, and be very increasingly possible over the next five, 10 years to only really see stuff that doesn't make you sad or angry. And the things that make us sad or angry are often new ideas that once we've had time to absorb them, make us think new things and see the world in different ways and can be really, really valuable. So I think that, for example, is a concern. But another way of looking at that is that we've always built our own filter bubbles. We just usually have to do it by hand. People would choose what newspaper they read and what sort of people they hung out with. And so the other side of that is that if people decide they don't want that, they don't want to just be presented with the things they already agree with, then it's much, much easier online to get access to, you know, people's experiences on the other side of the world, different people's viewpoints on your own city, what people, you know, what those people on your street think that disagrees with you about your local cafe, anything like that. So, you know, some of each, it depends on how we approach it. Okay, guys, um, I'd love to open it out to you lot for questions. What would you like to ask? Yes, gentleman in the hat. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask something about this distinction you make between like online and the real world. I just wonder whether that might be another generational gap, that whether children born now won't see the distinction between real and online because they are part of the same thing. They're not comparable, but they are both intertwined, they're not separate entities. I just wanted to know whether you think there is a distinction and what that is, if there is one. So this is a question about whether there's a generational gap in terms of the ways in which we think about the difference between the online and the real world, with the idea that the younger you are, that perhaps the more blended the two are and the less of a distinction you see between them. Who'd like to, to answer that? I, I just wanted to jump in because I think um, even for kind of our generation of people, you already have to make it really clear when you are talking about the real world because I feel like it's become kind of natural when you're saying like I was shopping or I bought something that you assume it's online. So you have to say like on the high street or brick and mortar or like dead tree now they call newspapers. So like um, I think it's already happening and I think it's really true that um, teenagers and younger are pretty much doing most of their, like like they said in the play, most of their kind of regular lives are being lived online. Like already the thing like the educational realm, they called it, that exists. You have, you know, Udacity and a bunch of um, universities who are completely offering their courses online. And um, same with health, you know, like there are ways now to contact your GP just uh, through your phone without ever having to visit the clinic, um, so I think that's it's already happening. I think it's already here. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, a few generations ago, reading the paper or watching the TV would be considered evil, wouldn't it? But of course, we've we've worked it into our our lives. There's absolutely no reason to to think this won't continue. I. I work with someone who um, will say, oh, I've got this friend, and will instantly say, are they a real friend, or do they have an at at the beginning of their um, name? And it, so it, it's true, I mean, it, it's completely blended. How far it will go, I don't know, but I can't really see any convincing argument why it won't go <laughs> that way. You know, I mean, you have people who are addicted to computer games now, and who spend um, a disproportionate amount of time online, it's seen as a bad thing, maybe for health reasons, but just to, as we've been saying, you get to meet people with different viewpoints from around the world, rather than the people who are in your geographic circle, which is, I don't think is a bad thing. Of course, it's, you know, you also meet people who write the blogs and who have viewpoints that you, you don't want anything to do with, but one assumes there's a way of, there will be, and there is a way of keeping them out. You know, there's, there's a whole new set of street smarts that we need to navigate safely online, just like you navigate a, a big city, there are areas you don't go, there are things you don't do, there are things you do do, like lock your, 
locking a door at night. So I think you know, the next generation, the one after that, will break new ground and the generation after that will come up more wise, if you see what I mean. So it will be the Wild West and then the next generation will have the smarts to you know, stay safe. And I actually think that um, teenagers are much more aware of how to be secure online and also how to mask their data, how to uh, get rid of their tracks. They're much more smart about stuff like that than, like, um, this is just a random anecdote, but my mum just recently got on Facebook and she got a weird message from a guy who she thought was my friend. And, and, then, he was, and then he said to her, oh no, um, what you know why don't we go and have sexy time and she's like no thank you <laughs> and like didn't know what to do with him and I, I don't know if, if it was my sister my younger sister or like my teenage cousins they would in, never have befriended a random person and talked to him on facebook messenger so i think it's like flipping over now that like kids are better prepared on and there was a study a few years ago showing that a lot of teenagers disable their accounts on some services when they're not logged into them so that no one can leave a comment on their wall that they can't immediately respond to or tag them in a photo that they haven't had the chance to say yes or no to. Like they find ways to control access to this information because it matters to them because so much of their life is there. And I definitely think in terms of even younger people, in terms of kids, the idea that the physical world and the digital world aren't as meaningfully distinct is getting stronger and stronger. There's a lot of games and toys around where you do something physically and it manifests digitally. And if you show these to even 20 year olds, you know, there's a PlayStation game where you put little toys on a thing and it scans them in and that's how you choose what character you're playing with in a game. There's games where you balance things on screens. There was, uh, I saw a lovely presentation a couple of weeks ago of a picture book with puzzles that you solve by moving around little bits of folding paper, which then manifest in the movements on the character on screen. And if you show that to adults, they're like, wow, this is amazing. And if you show it to five-year-olds, if you show it to the intended audience, they just go, yeah, this is neat. And they play on with it as if there was nothing remarkable about it. Great, brilliant. Um, he's got another question. This gentleman down here in the corner. Um, I want to ask the question that Mr. Woodnock said in the play, like, what I am I? Like, um, the matter, the way I understood it, wasn't about how, what adverts we see or what emails we get and what business choices we can do. It's about who we are. And these people that were in the interrogating room were wanted to be a different self. And touching the question you just did before and saying our generation or the younger generation are more blended in the internet. Do you believe that now because in the nether or the internet we can craft ourselves, we can make ourselves spotless and perfect, that we have actually forgotten our real in-world self? And if yes, how can we overcome and draw the boundary? This is a question about sort of identity and the relationship between identity both in the real world and in a virtual world. And the idea that the virtual identity is often a kind of cleaned up, perhaps, version of the self that isn't quite a true representation of the real self. And the idea of, of you know, how can we possibly maybe blend the two together more and is there potentially some kind of identity crisis that might be ahead of us with these two selves? Brilliant. Who'd like to, to start with that? Um, well, okay. So it's, it's kind of happening at the moment, I would say, in the opposite way. You, because uh, so many people um, who are shy, I, I'm generalising, but you know, people who may be shy in the real world gain a level of confidence, and that's due to the anonymity that is afforded when you're online. And that can mean you shout offence at people, you control people, you write in capitals when you wouldn't <laughs> speak in capitals. Um, and so it gives you a confidence to, I don't know, let, let what you want to be, I suppose, come out. The question of whether it create, whether you can be a different person online or whether it's just maybe an exaggerated version of the person you want to be, but for whatever reason can't be in the real world, that's already here. Then you look at Second Life, which of course is, is kind of referenced in the, the literature about Nether, which if you haven't seen Second Life, it's, it's like a crap boring video game where you walk into walls a lot. Um, and you have an avatar which walks around. 
you can furnish it the way you want. You know, you pay extra for private bits, and, and you can go to you can go to this kind of place in there. I mean, it's Second Life died a death a few um, years ago, but you could go to parties where people were kind of at weird animal avatars and then do the kind of stuff that is talked about in the play. So um, I, I wouldn't say it's a cleaned up version necessarily. It's it's a kind of exaggerated version that that people have online. But again, going back to the previous point, is it a different eye? Is, it, is there an eye in the real world and an eye there? I mean, it's all part and parcel of the same, the same you, if you were. I would say online you get to be exaggerated, and you, you do. You, it's not a life without consequence, but it's kind of a life without the, the barriers that you have as a person. You know, it's behind that veil of anonymity that you can maybe, you know, gain the... I wouldn't say courage, but you know, gain the confidence to do this kind of stuff, and you know, in the short term, to at least be more expressive than, than might be appropriate. Um, I mean, obviously, there are instances of bully, cyberbullying, and. Uh, people turning into things online that they would never be in the real world. But actually, I think that in most cases, on average, um, teenagers um, who are able to find a voice online, which they can't find in the real world, it actually helps them be better communicators, I would argue. Um, and I think it's the same I, but they're just finding it on a different platform. Um, I, I was reading about how um, having an audience makes you much more kind of uh, thoughtful about what you're saying and because there's such an kind of infinite audience online to everything you're posting and writing and doing uh, that makes you research things better that makes you kind of want to be right more of the time so I think it actually makes people uh, more responsible and kind of more I don't know better communicators online that, that's my opinion you asked a bit about the idea that being able to perfect ourselves online then has some sort of impact on how we see ourselves in the real world and the disjunct between that as well, I think. And I guess um, I'd say that we, that's, that's what everyone does in the world all the time, right? Because everyone has, has this sort of crisis of confidence when sort of drunk or sad occasionally that maybe nobody knows you, maybe nobody really likes you because they don't know what you're really like inside your head and the things you think and the mean things you sometimes wanted to say to them or whatever. And we, we managed to deal with that. I do think it's definitely true that we sometimes present an idealized version of ourselves online because it's easier to do that than it is in the real world. And sometimes that's an idealization of hiding things about ourselves that we don't like, even trying to hide them from ourselves. And sometimes it's an example of trying to do things or be things that we just practically can't be. You talked about second life a bit. And I agree that it is mostly super tedious, so tedious. Um, but I have a friend who was really, really into sailing and then she got sick and she couldn't go sailing anymore, and she found ways to satisfy some of her desires to do that through Second Life, but it's not the same thing. But she she ended up selling like cat costumes in Second Life to play, pay for progressively fancier sailing boats to go on Second Life adventures. And in a way, that's a sort of a, a, yeah, cat costumes that people could, I don't know what the Second Life term is, but like, um, structure that you can press a button and set out and make yourself a giant cat wandering around, you know. <laughs> like, people, people are more likely to do that than they are to like, precisely recreate 19th century carpet bags, really. <laughs> and so, sometimes, I think sometimes it is a matter of presenting just an idealised version of ourselves and hiding the flaws we wish we didn't have. And then there is the normal human disjunct of how do we deal with that, especially if you then meet people in the real world who you knew, know primarily on either the physical world, if you will. Um, but also I think it does importantly give people opportunities to try out different aspects of themselves that for whatever reason aren't available to them physically. Isn't that exactly what Nerdy was about? Trying yeah. Trying to are invisible in real life. Yep. And if we quote Detective Morris, it is in this world we have to live in, though, not in Nether. 
Um, I mean, I think she was quite heavily morally compromised by the end of the play, so I don't know that we need to take everything she says as necessarily true. I mean, just to say, I mean, we, we are different. Personally, I think we're different people to different people anyway. You know, I, I present, or maybe it's just me, I present, I'm, I'm slightly different depending on who I'm talking to. And so I don't really see a line between how you are online and how you are offline. We're, we're different to different people. Um, yeah, just that. There are occasionally stories of things like, um, there was a Reddit thread, I guess, six months or so back, a discussion forum where a woman went online saying, I've just found out that my husband is a troll on the internet. He left himself logged in and he is going on, you know, essays written by teenagers and telling them they're ugly and that they should kill themselves. And, you know, the community's advice was eventually that she should confront him, and she did. And he said, oh, it, it, it doesn't count, it's just online stuff. And so, you know, she ended up breaking up with him, um, divorcing her husband with a three-month-old child because she had found out that he is secretly a terrible, terrible person. But, like, you know, Clearly, he is just a terrible person and manages to hide it when he's face to face with people and found this outlet for it and when confronted with it, went, No, this bullying teenager on the internet is more important to me than my marriage. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, um, yeah. Lady over there. Before the birth of the internet, we were very much limited, like geographically especially. So when you have, you know, ideas, they're limited to where you are and where you're living and things like that. And the internet kind of opened that up, so ideas are more easily spread and are more multicultural. But do you think with um, data collection, data tracking, it has the potential to go from a positive sort of outlook on it to more negative, so that um, especially if you know young children you have such easy access to the internet, or suddenly maybe they happen upon something, and because they've been there, then data tracking is putting more and more such dangerous ideas, or whatever it may be, out to them, and with such impressionable minds. And do you think that could be a danger, uh, all this data tracking? Brilliant, so let me see if I can get this right. If I get it wrong, then just, just sort of... So this is a question about um, the idea that, especially if you're, if you're younger, that you might accidentally come across something online and then that gets linked into the, your sort of data tracking with the idea that that then is, is sort of shaping how you're seen? Yes, kind of, or how you are viewing the world or how you view things. So also that what you see might also change how you view the world as well, so that there's perhaps two levels of jeopardy that you might yeah. interact with. Um, and yeah, what do we what do we think about that as an idea? Is that something we need to be worried about? Brilliant. Who would like to take that? Can you say that question again? So it's a question about the idea of um, I guess all two things. On one hand, you could stumble across some things online, um, which might then shape your I guess what you might call your digital double, the persona that that is being created out of the out of the data that is being tracked about you so that it creates an idea of you that's actually not true. So if you're a small child and you accidentally end up on some awful website, that they might then think that you're, you're someone different and um, that might follow you in some way. Um, and also I guess that idea of if you see those things as well, does that then... Yeah, I'm more concerned about the opposite way so that perhaps you read these things and you, you kind of gain all that information and suddenly you are thinking that these things, you know, you're thinking these things that you've read and it becomes your views. That's more my outlook on it rather than that Okay, way. brilliant. So the, and then the, if you come across certain information on the internet, but then that, that might become your views because that's the information you're seeing and it's yeah. kind of been normalized on the internet so you don't realize the, the weight of what you're, what you're viewing in moral terms. Brilliant. Okay, great. Are we... <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think if you so you're talking about kids, right? I think that's the question that you know people have been also saying, like, should we have uh, password protected or like should we put limits on where the children can access porn, for example? 
Um, and kind of the, the way I see it is that just as you know, parental can, parents at home or teachers at school are kind of teaching kids in the real world what's morally right and wrong, that that's kind of their job for online as well. You can't really block out parts of the internet for, um, I don't know, I, I don't believe that you can restrict parts of the internet for different types of people based on who they are, even age, because um, th that becomes a problem for like open flow of information. So I think it has to be done at home when it comes to kids. Their parents and their schools have to put those controls in place. I think, um, but it's a tough one because it's hard to restrict children on the internet. Yeah, they get around any block, yeah. can't they? Because they know more about the controls exactly. than the parents do. Um, I interviewed someone from Israel a few months ago who did a study which said that if you hold a certain view, you'll go looking for sites that talk about that view. So you're not actually, this idea that we are learn, we're broadening our horizons is actually, in his opinion, not right because you kind of go looking for it and you mix with sites and people who share the same view as you. You know, if you, your friends on Facebook or on Twitter you know, possibly are in the circle of people that you would want to be with. And so you kind of amplify the same view and there's none of this, this broadening of of horizons. Now, I'm not sure I, I, I completely buy it, but it's interesting that you know, once you're in a club, once you start reading up on something, it's only going to be amplified because you're going to go looking for the links that are connected to what you're looking for. I mean, on, on the subject of kids and what they can find on the internet, I've got a four-year-old boy, I am terrified. I also have two parents, and I am terrified for them as well. I got a phone call a few years ago from my mum so your dad's, your dad's researching something on a Thailand holiday and he's clicked on a link and it now won't go away, it keeps popping up, you know, and you can imagine the sort of thing that he found to do with Thailand and, and Bangkok. And he said, yeah, I, I just, I, I accidentally clicked on something and it won't go away, it keeps popping up. So I, I, I worry at both ends of the spectrum. I don't know what we do about it because there's always stuff that they could stumble across. From a security point of view, there's two ways that you can restrict internet access. One is a blacklist and one is a whitelist. Uh, a blacklist is the sites that you know are bad, so you stop those from arriving at your computer, and that's done at an ISP, an internet service provider level, or the software on your computer. The other is a whitelist, and this is for younger kids. These, you only let the sites through that you do trust, so it's a much more restrictive thing. So for younger kids, that's what you have to do. The question of regulating the internet has come up time and again, but the beauty of the internet and also the, the pain of the internet is it crosses borders. No one can regulate it because it's bigger than anything. And so if you want to set up a dodgy website, you'll host it in Russia or the Ukraine, where- Submarine. Every, yeah, um, submarine, yeah, off uh, Malaysia. So um, whose jurisdiction does that fall under? The, um, the suggestion has been some sort of internet passport and it does sound like the nether, you have one login and that's it. Yeah. And you know, that's not a bad way to go because if your entire existence hands on, you only, you know, when you're born, you're given a login and that's it. If you screw it up, it's like screwing up your real self. Um, that's not a bad way to go because at least there's some culpability. You can't just delete the user and start again because you've, oops, committed a crime or, or, or trolled someone. But, you know, I mean, it's, above my pay grade, how you do this, how you police the internet, whether you should police the internet. Ask someone in China whether they want the internet policed and they will say no, of course, because, you know, and who, then who makes the rules?